Um, hi, everyone. So I think we're going to just get started. Um, I'm going to introduce um, the teach-in and just say a little bit about Platypus. Um, and we'll try to keep up with admitting people in the waiting room. We're both using like limited accounts. So unfortunately, we have to admit people by hand. Um, so I'm Stephanie, I'm just introducing. Um, so for those of you who aren't in the Platypus Affiliated Society, I'll just say a little bit about this organization, uh, which is the organization that is uh, bringing you this teach-in. Um, we are an organization that hosts the conversation on the left. Um, we um, raise questions about um, what the left is today and what the left has been. Um, we are a project for self-education on the left and the self-critique of um, what remains of the left and what has been of the left. Um, that said, we host um, teach-ins such as this one today, and we also have uh, reading groups, um, panels, uh, coffee breaks, um, which and the coffee breaks and reading groups uh, take place weekly. And those are all sort of campus-based for the most part. We have chapters all around. So if you're interested, you can visit platypus1917.org, uh, or you can contact anyone that you know um, in Platypus through social media or email. Um, there's an email address on the website as well. We'll be happy to, to answer any questions and uh, set you up with a local chapter. Um, and I won't speak too much to, um, I'll let Omer introduce uh, the teaching today and what sort of motivated it. But as I understand it, it's kind of, it was in part motivated by um, having just read the course on the syllabus. So um, at the very least, I think it'll be kind of timely and um, helpful to people who are new to the reading group syllabus. So I'll hand it off to Omer now and yeah. Great, so my name is Omer Hussein. I'm a member of uh, the Platypus Affiliated Society that Stephanie just introduced. And I'm a chapter member in our Cincinnati chapter. And like Stephanie said, if you're interested in joining one of our activities or reading groups, you can find more information at platypus1917.com. Uh, .org, sorry. Uh, yeah, to, to introduce the event, I'm just gonna read from the Facebook page. Um, I'll be presenting a paper that I wrote. Um, it's a little long, it's gonna take about 20 minutes to read. I've tried to share the file to the chat, but I'm having trouble with that. So I'll be sharing my screen so you can at least follow along with the text. Uh, and hopefully it'll be published perhaps in the Platypus Review in the near future. I'll be with that. Um, there you go. Great. Sure. All right. So I'm just going to uh, just try to scroll as you read it. Read the introduction and then I'll start with the paper and then after the paper's <clears throat> finished, we can just open it up for discussion and question and answer. For over a century, Marxists and leftists have vehemently accused their political enemies of being undialectical. Why is that criteria being dialectical so important for Marxist thought? What does it mean that the category of dialectics is understood to indicate the depth of fidelity or infidelity one maintains to Marxism? To answer that question, one has to return to the philosopher of bourgeois revolution par excellence, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel whose profound thought and method had a world shattering effect that Marx enthusiastically inherited and felt tasked by. It is contained alongside the general inheritance of Marxism by, by Marxism of bourgeois revol revolutionary thought and the category dialectics. And so, you know, that is setting up, I guess, this paper, which I will now read. So the paper is called Hegel's Dialectics, Non-Identity, Contradiction and Freedom. The first question that perhaps comes to mind is what is Hegelian dialectics? I could provide a one-line definition such as the inter interpenetration of opposites, but I realize that such a definition might not mean much. Adorno astutely asserts that dialectics eludes definition by its very nature, that it is better demonstrated than defined. Perhaps a more fruitful but less short, straightforward way of getting at the matter is through a different question. Why dialectics for Hegel? If we can agree that Hegel was doing more than intentionally trying to be edgy or mystifying, we must ask ourselves why Hegel thought his dialectics was necessary for his philosophy. My central claim is that Hegel finds his dialectics necessary because he is attempting to more adequately comprehend 
an object in a process of change and transformation. The character of this change, how the object is changing, is of deep significance and something I will address later. To paint a very broad picture, if philosophy has always been concerned with grasping the truth of reality, prior to Kant and Hegel, but more importantly, prior to the development of modern bourgeois society, this truth was understood to be eternal, essentially static and unchanging. Plato grants that the world of the senses is in a state of constant flux, but true reality for Plato lies in the unchanging world of forms, grasped by unchanging reason. The true is true for Plato precisely because both it and our ability to comprehend it through reason doesn't change. I would argue that this is the essential characteristic of traditional pre-critical philosophy, an assertion of a static, unchanging, eternal truth. The Hegel scholar Robert Pippin defines traditional metaphysics as a priori knowledge of substance. My face. Why is substance or truth able to be known a priori? Because neither truth nor our ability to know it transforms in traditional philosophy. What would it mean for truth and reason's capacity for grasping it to be transformable, a process of change? It is an important question because as I hope to demonstrate, it is at the heart of life Hegel finds dialectics necessary. To begin to address the question, permit me to use a crude and perhaps misleading parable to make a point that I will further specify later. Here I am riffing off of an example Hegel provides in the beginning of the phenomenology of spirit. Let us pretend that we had never experienced a seed before and one day we stumbled upon one lying in the dirt. What would it mean to philosophically grasp the truth of the seed? We would immediately make theoretical, practical and aesthetic judgments about the object before us. We would speculate about questions like what the thing was and where it came from. We would think about what uses and purpose it, purposes it could be put to. We would find its size, color, and shape pleasing or unpleasing to the eye. Let's say that after some deliberation, we came to conclusive answers about these questions, answers that satisfied us. She said he's a lady. We then decided to leave the seat alone for a while and only return to it months later for further study. To our shock, the seed had transformed into a flower bud. We would not only have to make new judgments about a new object, but we'd be compelled to find a way to explain to ourselves how the seed we had comprehended a certain way related to this new mysterious flower bud that seemed to demand an entirely new set of judgments. <laughs> We would have to deal with the fact that the transformation of the seed into a flower bud was not merely a quantitative change, not merely an increase or decrease in seedness, but a radically qualitative change, demanding not only a new set of judgments, but a whole new set of criteria for judging the object. The object had changed in such a way that the flower bud fundamentally challenged the basic conditions of intelligibility that allowed us to make sense of the seed. In becoming a flower bud, the object had negated its condition as a seed and simultaneously negated the criteria of judgments we had applied to the seed. For the seed to become what it was destined to become, it had to negate itself. We walk away scratching our heads, daunted by the fact that in order to grasp the new truth revealed about the seed, we are forced to negate and transform everything we held previously, we had previously held to be true. Because we are dedicated to the search for truth, we eventually do this and arrive at a new system for comprehending the flower bud, confident in its adequacy for grasping the new object. We return to the flower bud weeks later to test out our new philosophical apparatus. We are met by another shock. The flower bud is now a blooming rose. We are forced to undergo the same painful process of transforming our conception of truth to meet the demands of another transformation of the object. 
But this time, something is also revealed about our former positions and the former conditions of the object. Their meaning has changed. What once seemed to us to be an irre irreconcilable antagonism, the truth of the seed against the truth of the bud that had negated it, is now recognized as distinct moments unified by the fact that there were instances of a process whose result is now before us. It turns out that, despite how it appeared to us formerly, two things that seemed opposed to each other, the seed against the bud, have resolved their opposition and that we can now grasp them as interrelated moments in a process of change. For the seed to become what it truly was, it had to first negate itself and then sublate, to use a Galian terminology, this negation as a moment in a process leading to its true destiny, a higher form, the blooming rose. This parable is highly fallacious if taken as a literal example of Hegelian dialectics. I don't intend to get into a dialectics of nature discussion here. The main reason this parable might be misleading is because a seed doesn't transform itself through its own reflection and activity, but simply changes in accord with the laws of nature. A seed is not self-conscious. A seed is not free. The object of Hegel's philosophy what he sought to comprehend was not the mindless and automatic changes that took place in dead nature, but freedom in history. Change that was driven by a self-legislating subject through the use of reason. Freedom for Hegel was the process in which a mutually constitutive subject and object of knowledge reciprocally transformed each other through a dialectical relationship, through a speculative identity that played out in history. The change Hegel attempted to grasp was neither arbitrary nor preordained. It was a movement whose content was a subject coming to awareness of itself through the recognition that it was transforming the object it sought to know, the object that conditioned its own reality. Freedom was the coming to re realization that we could change the objective circumstances that shaped us and thus change ourselves. This process is what Hegel's philosophy sought to raise to consciousness. The purpose of the clumsy parable was to illustrate the depth of difficulty entailed in the task Hegel set for himself. How does one maintain commitment to the idea of truth while simultaneously recognizing truth as a process of transformation in which what is true must become true by negating and changing its own conditions of being true? How does one adhere to the claim that truth exists while concurrently comprehending that truth exists only as a movement of self-transformation in which truth must realize itself by negating and overcoming its own existence as truth? What I am perhaps obviously raising is the issue of contradiction. Hegel understands the change he's attempting to raise to consciousness as made both possible and necessary by contradiction. Freedom proceeds through contradiction. What exists is self-contradictory to the extent that its existence expresses possibilities for change that can only be realized through the negation of this existence. This is why Hegel needs dialectics, to grasp a process of change driven by contradiction. One way Hegel uses dialectics to deal with this difficult problem is in his use of the speculative proposition. Hegel is often misread undialectically because his speculative propositions are read as ordinary propositions. In an ordinary proposition, what is asserted is an identity between the subject and the predicate of the proposition. To illustrate this more concretely, Let's address one of Hegel's most misunderstood propositions. The real is rational. If this were an ordinary proposition, what would be claimed is an identity between the subject of the proposition, the real, and its predicate, is rational. In other words, if this were an ordinary proposition, it would mean what many poor readers of Hegel take it to mean, mainly what, that whatever exists, the real, is always identical with rationality simply by the fact that it exists. This is how Hegel is misread as a conservative thinker. 
he's mistakenly read to be saying that whatever happens to exist is eternally reasonable. And thus the charge is made that Hegel merely apologizes and advocates for the way things are. Read as an ordinary proposition, Hegel is understood as making a static and unchanging claim about what is always true. He is read as making a traditional metaphysical claim. I would suggest that an ordinary proposition puts us back in the world of traditional philosophy because the nature of the proposition seems to assert a timeless truth, an unchanging identity between subject and predicate. I would go further and suggest that as Chris Catron states in unpublished remarks, the very nature of ordinary logic and language seems to belong to the world of traditional philosophy and traditional metaphysics because ordinary language and logic seem to be suited to making claims about and referring to a static, unchanging, eternal reality and truth. So the task Hegel is faced with is how to use logic and language, tools historically used to make claims about eternal truth, to talk about truth as a process of change and transformation. He doesn't give up on these tools because there are no other tools, but he is forced to use them in a radically new and transformed way. I would argue that this speaks to why Hegel might be difficult to read and comprehend. Hegel's way of dealing with the problem of how to use logic and language to address truth as a process of transformation is the speculative proposition. For Hegel, if an ordinary proposition asserts a simple and static identity between subject and predicate, it becomes tautological. Something is true simply by the fact that it is true. How can an ordinary proposition be more than tautological, more than an assertion of an identity that is already presupposed as an identity? What does an ordinary proposition add when what is being claimed as true is true because it is true? Hegel's radical move is to reframe the way we think about an ordinary proposition. If an ordinary proposition asserts an identity between subject and predicate, and if this is supposed to be more than a tautology, a restatement of something that we already know and is self-evident, then Hegel's claim is that the identity asserted in an ordinary proposition is also an expression of non-identity. If we propose that the real is rational, then this must also mean that the real is not rational. Otherwise, why would we need to assert their equivalence in a proposition? Hegel develops the speculative proposition out of a contradiction he recognizes in ordinary propositions. In the speculative proposition, the identity asserted between the subject and predicate is also an assertion of their non-identity. The real is rational is a speculative proposition. The claim Hegel is making is that the real is rational precisely because the real is also not rational. To ordinary logic, this statement is a nonsensical contradiction. But if we understand truth as a process of transformation through contradiction, perhaps we can get a better handle on what Hegel is saying. If rationality is not a static state, but a process of becoming, then to say that the real is rational means to say that the real must become rational by recognizing that the real is also not rational as it exists. The contradictory statements, the simultaneous identity and non-identity of subject and predicate are moments in a process of becoming. The real is rational because both reality and rationality are part of a movement of freedom that is driven by the negation of what is real and rational for the sake of realizing what is real and rational. The real must become rational by negating and transforming both reality and rationality. The speculative proposition is an attempt to grasp a process of change driven by contradiction. If Hegel's dialectical philosophy is a radical transformation of a traditional philosophical conception of truth, how and why did this transformation happen? How did we get from Plato's eternal realm of forms to Hegel's assertion that philosophy is its own time comprehended and thought? What are the historical conditions of possibility for Hegel's conception of truth as historical. Following Kant, Hegel strives to be critical, critical in the Kantian sense of being aware 
of one's own conditions of possibility. Hegel not only conceives of truth as historical, but also self-reflexively recognizes that his own conception of truth as historical is itself grounded in and an expression of his own historical moment. Hegel explicitly understands his philosophy and its conception of truth as historical as itself an expression of the bourgeois revolution, the world historical transformation from feudal servitude to a society mediated by free wage labor. Hegel's philosophy, specifically the phenomenology of spirit, is a retrospective account of the emergence of this bourgeois consciousness, the historically evolving consciousness of history as the story of freedom. Hegel's account of the emergence of this bourgeois consciousness is encapsulated in a parable contained in the phenomenology of spirit, a parable commonly referred to as the master-slave dialectic. This name is misleading for reasons that are related to how the parable is often misunderstood. I would argue, perhaps polemically, that the significance of the master-slave dialectic is not that it is a dialectic between master and slave. It is not an account of an intersubjective dialectic, but an account of the emergence of the subject-object dialectic. For Hegel, an intersubjective dialectic would require mutual recognition of self-consciousness by two free self-conscious subjects. The point is that the slave, as slave, is in no position to recognize the master because the master does not recognize the slave as a free self-conscious subject. Thus, in the absence of mutual self-conscious recognition of the other's freedom and self-consciousness, neither, neither the slave nor the master are subjects. The real point of the master-slave dialectic is that it is a dialectic between the slave and himself. The slave, an unfree subjectless being, is for forced to work by the master. Through his labor, the slave transforms nature. By transforming nature through work, he comes to recognize himself in the objects he has created. He arrives at an awareness by objectifying himself through labor that it is his own activity that is transforming the world. And through this act of self-reflection, he also transforms himself. The master becomes unessential because he does not work. By objectifying himself through labor and changing nature, the slave comes to a self-consciousness that it is his own activity that counts. Through this activity, through this objectification, he reflects on himself and recognizes his freedom, thus becoming a subject. His freedom is tied to the self-consciousness that he is a free subject able to transform the objectivity that conditions his own self-consciousness. The yoke of the master is discarded. Through unfreedom, he arrives at the recognition of his freedom. As Hegel puts it in lectures on the philosophy of history, the humankind has not liberated itself from servitude, but by means of servitude. The main significance of this account I want to emphasize is that it specifies why dialectics is necessary for Hegel and how the dialectic emerges. My earlier parable was faulty because it may have suggested that we need dialectics as an abstract method to apply to contradiction and change in a foreign external object. There is a truth to this form of appearance, but Hegel's real point is that dialectical change is produced by our own activity and reflection. We need dialectics to grasp a dialectical reality that we are continuously producing dialectically. For Hegel, labor is the source of the dialectic. What must be comprehended dialectically is the contradiction produced by our own activity, the splitting of what once was a static whole into a recipro reciprocally constituting and transformative contradiction or non-identity between ourselves as both subjects and objects of the historical process whose unfolding Hegel calls the absolute. Okay, so that is the extent of my by paper, um, we can open it up for questions and discussion now. Uh, I know Richard raised his hand midway through the paper, so I, he must already have something to say. So 
maybe we can start with Richard and then other people can jump in as, as they wish. Okay, thank you, Amir. So uh, I have sort of a, a double. So first of all, you began with this a kind of biological metaphor and then you said, I don't wanna get into the question of dialectics of nature, but mm -hmm. since I just did a teach it, I'm curious to hear your view on it. And the reason I asked the question is it seems to me that the, the philosophical issue behind the question of whether there's dialectics in nature has to do with two views of dialectics. One is that dialectics have an objective character that determines the structure of the world. And the other is that that's kind of a, it's part of the human world, it's part of a method, and that isn't necessarily part of an objective reality and doesn't necessarily apply to the non-human world. And these kind of two opposed views. And also, since you bring up the question of historical change, I'm wondering, since the word dialectics is used before Hegel by other philosophers like Kant and Plato and probably others, those are the ones I know of, but with different meanings, like I'm wondering whether you see any continuity between like a pre-Hegelian dialectic, conception of dialectics and Hegel, or you think that Hegel essentially created the conception of dialectics that you're defending. Um, and again, then that would pose in the question of post-Hegel, do you see a fundamental continuity between Hegel and Marx? Or do you think that Marx added or subtracted or changed in some way Hegel's conception of dialectics? Mm. Yeah, so the, the first question is dialectics about an objective phenomena in the world or is it about merely the subjective human method to get at dialectics. I mean, I think the kind of really significant claim of Hegel is that it is both, uh, you know, that you have to dialectically recognize how the object, the objective reality one is attempting to comprehend is not solely, is constituted or transformed by the subject's attempt to know it. And so the reason dialectics is both a method and the actual structure of the world is that for Hegel, both are mutually constitutive in a process. Um, and so I guess I use that metaphor because I thought it set up how it, the question might appear as one of in the foreign world. And I hope throughout the paper to kind of address how that form of appearance is also for Hegel a process that is overcome in the recognition, let's take the slave and the, and the master, and the recognition by the slave that in working, he is transforming the objective world he's trying to know. And so through that activity, this is the relationship between dialectics as both a subjective method and an objective structure of the world. That there's an interaction between the human subject and the objective foreign sensuous world. Um, Can I say something? Also, I think I'd like to redirect it to uh, Richard's question a little more like precisely, I feel like, Omer and I would both agree on, we've like talked about it, like that, uh, you know, like the Hegelian, like uh, subject object dialectic is neither something to be like a dynamic to be found in nature that like gives things shape, nor is it Hegel's own discovery that it's like a already sort of like self, like, like more or less like self understood process in bourgeois society coming to self consciousness that Hegel's like simply just like, you know, describing in like a more clearly. It doesn't doesn't Hegel find dialectics in nature? I yeah, mean, yeah, that, but that, as, as a form of appearance of bourgeois society as well. well. That's the tricky thing. I guess I yeah. left it out because I didn't know how to deal with it. Uh, to the extent to which I think there's a dialectics of nature, I come at it from someone like Trotsky, who would say, I know I've brought this example up many times to you, Richard, who will say something like, the struggle for socialism extends back to the emergence of the first single-celled organism. Uh, that in retrospect, there appears to be a self-consciousness in nature, and yet to grasp that self-consciousness in nature requires society. And so even that kind of antinomy between a dialectics of nature and a dialectics of society might itself be a kind of false form of appearance in that both are relating to each other in a process. Um, you know, as far as Plato and dialectics, I, I don't, you know, I don't feel like adequately uh, suited to speak to dialectics and someone like Plato. Uh, I guess I would just say the interesting thing is that Hegel does recognize that the process of unfolding of something like truth as a metaphysical category affects the character of truth in the past. 
And so he, I think he would grant that something like religion was an adequate form of expression for the subject object, for the unfolding of freedom for a specific time. But as I was talking to Danny about it, he would look back to Plato and say, Plato has become untrue as a function of the truth revealed in his own historical moment. So I don't, I don't know if I can speak to the kind of fine grained details of how, uh, you know, what is dialectics for Plato. Uh, but I do think that Hegel will relate other claims to truth and other ways of grasping truth as not merely false, but as a moment in unfolding, which had to be rendered false for us to get to where we're at now. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about Marx's dialectic, I mean, this was gonna be a larger paper in which I wanted to address that. Uh, so I think it's a tricky question, but you know, the next paragraph I was gonna start with basically is that if Hegel's dialectic begins with self-recognition through activity, Marx introduces the categories of necessary misrecognition and estranged activity. And so to put it very loosely, I think that what Marx is taking up from Hegel is a, a dialectical world that Hegel was comprehending. And yet the peculiar, peculiarity of bourgeois society in the age of capitalism is that it comes to contradict itself. So the process of Hegelian dialectics that points to freedom for Marx also becomes the dialectic of freedom dominating us, of freedom becoming unfreedom. In some sense, I don't know, I would say polemically that uh, Hegel's ought, the movement of the ought, of the claim to what could be, is rendered antonymical. Is the ought or the claim to what could be in this society the realization of labor or the abolition of labor? It appears as both, right? So that Hegel's dialectic is rendered self-contradictory, which you know, Marx deals with in a specific way. But I would say that Marx is inheriting a dialectic of freedom that has become a dialectic of domination. Just one brief point and then I'll, I'll get off. So uh, in one point, you seem to equate self-evidence and tautology. It seems to me those are two quite different categories. Something can be self-evident, but not tautologically true. Uh -huh. And tautologies can be quite unself-evident, but that's a separate issue. No, I mean, that's a good point. I was, I was gonna actually take out that line self-evident because you're right, the tautology is not necessarily self-evident. What I meant though, is, I mean, to just paraphrase what I said is that if the assertion of a truth is true because there's an identity between the subject and predicate of what you're asserting, then in the proposition, there's an assumption of a truth that should be made true in logic, right? So that maybe it's not self-evident to someone outside of the proposition. But what Hegel, I think, sets up, and I'm just for people's interest, I'm really getting this discussion of speculative propositions from uh, Julian Rose's work, uh, uh, Hegel Contra Sociology. Um, so where she basically she'll say that it might not be self-evident, but the logical form of the proposition for Hegel is saying something on the basis of saying that you're saying something. If, yeah, I don't know if that helps, but yeah, I would agree with you. It's not initially self-evident. Um, Tom had his hand up. Maybe Tom Canal. I mean, if other people want to jump in too or raise your hands, I'll, I'll Tom, if you want to go ahead. Sure. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, that was great. Thank you very much um, for for doing this. Um, I wanted to ask, kind of following on from from Richard's question. Um, Ask, ask whether what you think of making this distinction between um, a Marxist understanding uh, of a dialectic and a Hegelian understanding of a dialectic. Um, like I sort of read in 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 Hegel, and perhaps I'm misreading, and you will you will correct me um, that that a big part of of the of what drives the, the dialectical process forward. Um, is the inadequacy of objects to their concept. Um, so, so um, and that, that would seem to be a sort of I idealist um, um, way of thinking about it. Um, I understood from Adorno, and again, if I'm misreading it, please, please correct me, that, um, that what sort of drives dialectical thinking for Adorno is the inadequacy inadequacy of the object of the of the concept in relationship to the object 
Um, and um, I have sort of like two, which which sounds, which seems more materialist somehow. Um, and I have sort of two questions. One is, do you think that that is a good way of thinking the difference between Marxist dialectics and Hegelian dialectics or materialist, materialist dialectic and the idealistic, uh, idealist um, dialectic? Um, and two, if it is, what, what if anything is changed about the inner structure of the dialectic um, by basically uh, making concepts inadequate to objects rather than objects inadequate to concepts. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, I think those are okay characterizations, but I think we need to flesh out what kind of claims they are, right? That they're not, a tr Adorno's promise of the object, which I was going to address in this as well, once again, I don't think can be read as a traditional metaphysical claim that Hegel had a primacy of the subject and now I'm introducing another epistemological inverted uh, characterization that's true for all time that Hegel just missed, which is it's actually the object that is that moves the subject. I would say that it expresses a historical shift uh, in reality. Um, so for example, let's say that we'll go with the first characterization that for Hegel, the concept comes to recognize, or how did you put it? The object comes to recognize its own inadequacy and relationship to the concept. Well, the problem with measuring capitalism by its concept is that its concept itself is self-contradictory. What is the concept of this society that should measure reality? Is it that this society is the realization of labor as freedom? Or is it that this society points beyond the real is, or this society needs to negate labor as a form of freedom. It appears as both. And so to uphold the concept to reality in a Hegelian fashion, what Marx recognizes the concept itself is rendered antonymical. Um, and so for Adorno, I think that the significance of talking about the premise of the object, and I've infuriated people by saying this, but to say that for, if Adorno is a good dialectician, you could understand him saying the premise of the object is also him saying the primacy of the subject in a mediated way, right? That those can't be pulled apart so cleanly. But let's go with the primacy of the object. And, and perhaps what I'd suggest is that as a function of the dialectic of Hegel coming into self-contradiction, it is actually the object that appears to be transforming faster than we as subjects can comprehend. Uh, and so Adorno's claim about the primacy of the object, I think, is about a historical transformation in reality in which what we were once recognizing ourselves and constituting in Hegel's world, the objective we reality we encounter through self-reflection and self-consciousness as a function of that self-reflection being self-contradictory as a result of a self-contradictory object, the kind of dynamic that entails is that it seems like the object is running away from us, uh, that capitalism is moving faster than we can conceptually grasp and comprehend. And so I think Adorno's premise of the object is really about a historical transformation in reality and society. Do you think that there's any, I mean, sort of, um, you know, I don't know if um, people, people have read Lucio Coletti's, um, what, what is it, Marx and Hegel, or Marxism and, he and Hegel, whatever the book is called. Um, and he makes a big deal about um, the, the importance of in, or the concept of infinity for Hegel, and that, that basically that 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 anything um, finite um, is um, is 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 um, is is contradictory, and therefore to re and therefore to reach truth and transcend um, contradiction. You need to somehow um, realize or or access the infinite, um, and like Adorno, on the other hand, seems to be very skeptical and suspicious of any sort of totalizing um, inf infinitude. Um, do you do you think that's a, a relevant re relevant distinction, or um, or am I going down the wrong path? I mean, once again, this is a these are large claims, but I would claim that. Adorno is critical of a kind of bad infinity because it becomes an apology for capital as unfolding the new all the time. 
that rather what you have in capital is that even our conception of what would lie beyond this society and infinite progress of change is itself rendered problematic and contradictory because we're thinking that concept on the grounds of a contradictory reality. And so, you know, Adorno will point to, I mean, I think Chris refers to it as critical reification, that to recognize the static moment in the dialectic, not simply the unfolding ceaseless process of becoming, but where dialectics comes to a standstill as an equally critical moment in transformation, uh, that you can't simply kind of speed through the process of becoming by pointing to the infinity of everything, rather the moments where the process of becoming becomes ossified and still and objectified in a way that seems unchanging might be important to not overlook simply by a kind of theory of infinite progress in capitalism. And this is why the extent of a qualitative transformation is really important. That the kind of transformation we're talking about is not simply more or less, but a qualitative transformation in which our conception of what lies beyond capitalism would qualitatively be transformed with the transformation of capitalism. And to try and posit an infinite becoming on the grounds of this society would be liable to expressing the same contradictions one is trying to overcome. So I, that's how I'd address in, infinity. Um, hopefully Danny is raising his hand. Maybe he'll have something to say to this too. Danny, if you oh. want. Uh, well, I had a, a question, but I don't know. Maybe you can oh, relate it back. Um, well, I'm looking at what you have on uh, screen right now, and you say um, for Hegel, labor is the source of dialectic. But um, in your response to Tom right now, you were just uh, mentioning uh, that we can speculate on stuff beyond labor, right? That you, we can, you know, walking around rural Pennsylvania right now, right? We can see all sorts of things that seem to go beyond the labor relation, and those would seem to presuppose some kind of logical constitution and some sort of way of understanding them. Um, and it would seem like, you know, you have reduced Hegel to labor here, right? That would be like a, the sort of challenge in that sense, right? That, you know, obviously in order to even speculate on something beyond it, then the question is how can you do so, right? In that sense. Um, so I, I just wanted to raise that question. I can say more, but. I just wanted to bring that up about what you mean by that then. Because it would, you know, someone might say, well, this seems to even reduce them to political economic activity, or maybe someone who knows that when Marx says labor, it's not just political economic, to some kind of social activity that we can speculate on something beyond such. And therefore, how can you do so, Omer or any of us? Little, you know. So how does Hegel's dialectic grasp like the beyond of labor? Well, it's, I mean, if you, I mean, for, here's another way I can put it. Someone might say that Hegel is describing thought per se. And so if you're, if this is going to be reduced to labor, then the question is how could one even speculate on something beyond labor? I mean, I'm just looking at the, the sentence for Hegel labor is a source of dialectic. So how could one well, I guess maybe a better word is activity, right? I mean, because we think of labor as something very specific, but that rather the appearance of the world as a foreign object that we simply contemplate, that form of appearance for Hegel is overcome in the fact that we're interacting with the object as we're trying to know it. So even that interaction, if, even if it's a conceptual one, a conceptual interaction between the object, even that conceptual interaction is still an activity to think is to do, right? To think is an action, to think is an activity. Uh, and so to even think about something, Hegel's point is that we're transforming it through the activity of objectifying it as something. Uh, and that process of objectification, not only of the external world, of, or, but of oneself, is essential for Hegel's conception of truth as a process. That like the master and the slave, we're not subjects if we don't objectify ourselves and aren't objectified by others. And that kind of objectification, I think, is an activity, not something that merely happens in our heads. Um, I would say the extent to which this society seems to point beyond labor is a kind of result of a self-contradiction that Marx recognizes that Hegel might not have picked up on or experienced the world that way, that it was a different world Marx inherited 
in which the contradiction of labor as the medium through which freedom is achieved, we, through labor, we objectify ourselves and we objectify the world. For Marx, that process of recognition breaks down in which the way we are objectifying the world seems to make the world only more foreign to us to the extent to which Marx needs the category of necessary misrecognition, right? If for Hebel, we recognize ourselves through labor, for Marx, labor is precisely the site where we are unable to recognize ourselves in the object. And to the extent to which things seem to be beyond the dialectic of labor, I don't think sp speaks to a kind of anachronism to say that labor is the source of the dialectic for Hegel, but rather <laughs> the dialectic has become self-contradictory in a new way which point makes both labor as a social relation and the abolition of labor two moments or two antinomies that could be overcome in a, in a future praxis or relationship to the world. Can I just what? push you on the last thing quickly? I know yeah. that there are other hands and I don't, I certainly don't want to monopolize the time. You know, you, you mentioned the category of necessary misrecognition, but then the question would be like, how can we recognize that misrecognition? Well, I mean, I don't think we can, right? I don't think that's Marx's point is that it's only necessarily misrecognized because we haven't thought about it adequately. Rather, it's necessary, right? It's not, a, it's not an unnecessary form of recognition. It's essential to what the object and who we are as subjects is in this society, that we misrecognize our own activity. So, I mean, I guess I would, you know, Marx saying philosophy has only interpreted the world. The point is to change it, right? The point of philosophy, philosophy still has knowing the world. The point to knowing the world is that it must be transformed through that necessary misrecognition. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. On there? Yeah. So, so I guess the, the question that comes up for me in this description is one of the things you emphasize is the need for dialectics to recognize transformation and historical change. Mm. But... And then in the, you know, the description you talk about Marxists and leftists accusing people of being undialectical, but it would seem to me that there are other ways of describing historical transformation and change other than the language of dialectics, right? It's not dialectics is, has to be something beyond merely a recognition of historical transformation and change, mm -hmm. right? It's not that simple of like an opposition between just a static traditional philosophy a la Plato and a kind of dialectical, historical, modern bourgeois consciousness. And certainly there are many forms of historical consciousness uh, that would be different from Marxism or that would re try to reinterpret Marxism in a way that removed it from a language of dialectic. So I'm sort of trying to understand why you think specifically dialectics and Hegelian dialectics is necessary to grasp historical change. Uh, I think I said he feels like he has to more adequately grasp it. And I think why he thinks he's more adequately grasping it, and this is the kind of thing I brought up later that I should have maybe emphasized earlier, is that it's not a change producing an external object, but it's the change we ourselves are producing in splitting ourselves into subjects and objects through our own activity, through our own emancipation. So it's not just change in general, you're right, and I think I set it up like that, but it should be specified that it's change that we're participating in. So how do you think about something that's not only changing, but changing as a function of you thinking about it? And I think that's why Hegel needs dialectics. The specific character of change is driven by the subject who's attempting to no. I, I guess I, I guess I was asking really about why Marxism needs dialectics, not about why Hegel needs dialectics. I, I don't think Marx looks at like, I'm not suggesting this is what you're saying, but I don't think Marx looks at like different epistemological methods and like picks one. Rather, he recognizes the kind of necessity, perhaps a bad necessity, an unfortunate necessity of dealing with Hegel's dialectics, because to him, the world has become dialectical and philosophical. Uh, that Hegel has proven true in some sense, uh, that it's the matter at hand that demands dialectics. I think this is why Adorno says, I don't like pick dialectics off a shelf of tools or something. I submit myself to the materialist dialectic. I submit myself to the way I think the matter at hand, the world itself is moving dialectically. So I, I, yeah, I, I mean, it's a tough question to answer 
how does freedom and necessity come into it? But I, I would argue for Marx on the level of, of a kind of necessity um, that the world itself seems to demand dialectical treatment. Let's, okay, Aaron, if you wanna go. Oh yeah, thanks Amir. I mean, I think this is related to but what both Richard and Danny were saying and I wanted to kind of bring Danny's question back in as in, couldn't you say that the way in which capital appears to go beyond labor or to point beyond labor also appears to point backwards before labor? That it appears either nihilistic or as you know the return to some earlier stage. So, for example, you know, I, I thought about this when um, Richard brought up that there, are, well, there are other ways of thinking about history besides the dialectic. Um, when I was at the University of Chicago, I was taking a class with one of Moish Bastone's friends, Bill Sewell, and he had us read um, this book um, by North and Thomas, trying to explain how feudalism developed into capitalism, and then how you know history develops um, based on kind of biological models of metabolism and famine and these sorts of things. So, and uh, you know, postmodernism, right? As kind of a premature post-capitalism, we could say, um, also seems to take up something that comes before labor or ways of thinking about history in the world that are um, pre-capitalist. And so I think what Danny was trying to push is how the forms of reification in society point towards the methods of their overcoming. So this would be like in uh, the theological political fragment of Benjamin, where he says that, you know, um, the uh, method of, or uh, the method used by world history is nihilism, right? That sort of thing. And so I think part of the question here is what is the, um, how, how should we think about how the Hegelian dialectic breaks down in capitalism and what that meant to Marxism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, to get at that question, maybe to get at Richard's question again too, another thing I'd specify is that Hegel and Marx both ground their own method in their own moment. So they don't merely apply dialectics to a foreign material, they apply dialectics to themselves. They recognize themselves as products of a kind of dialectical reality. I mean, I, I think you're right that for Marx, simply the recognition that the society might point beyond labor, that recognition is itself ideological and could mean many different things. Could mean, yeah, rich, that we've never been modern, that we're returning to a kind of medievalism, uh, that the point is to kind of like smoke a lot of pot and quit your job and start an anarcho squat. That's like beyond labor. Um, that like the recognition of how this society points beyond labor is itself something that can't simply be, be prefiguratively thought about and then implemented. I mean, I think this is my big thing with why Marx kind of forsakes a prefigurative formulation of what society beyond capitalism would look like, because he recognized that our own thinking about the future is grounded in the eternal present of capitalism. And so to even conceptualize what beyond labor would look like, itself speaks to a society that renders our thoughts self-contradictory. Um, and so in that sense, the point isn't that the society just kind of transparently points beyond labor, but that it expresses a contradiction in labor that without telling us what it's overcoming would be, to recognize it as a contradiction in good Hegelian fashion means that to recognize it as a moment of potential transformation and self overcoming. Um, I don't know, does that speak to your question? Yeah, I think it does. Thanks, Omar. Yeah. Okay, Justin and then Grant. Trust me, if you're speaking, we're, we're not hearing much. I think your mic, good. If your mic, all we're hearing is kind of static, or at least that's what I'm hearing. Um, I don't know if it's your mic. If you want to write to the chat, I could read it from there as well. Uh, why don't we move on to Grant and if Justin, you can get your mic working or if you want to write to the, let me check the chat right now. Okay, we'll move on to Grant. Okay, so I have a kind of a maybe amateurish question, but it's, uh, it's kind of related to some of the questions that have come up before. So uh, Richard mentioned that dialectics is an original to Hegel and you mentioned Plato and Kant. Uh, 
I was thinking of Kant when you're talking about uh, labor as the source of the dialectic uh -huh. and the interrelation between pure and practical reason. Uh -huh. and I was also reminded of hearing Chris Catron say in the past that with Kant, philosophy begun and with Hegel, it ended. Mm -hmm. Um, and so on one, I want to, I, I want to hear you talk a little bit about that, about what you think that might mean in terms of, uh, the philosophy of freedom is what I imagine where, where Chris was going with that. But then also what you brought up a second ago, Marx's thesis on Feuerbach, the point is to change it. Um, I, I guess, I mean, I have like a very, uh, vague idea of what I've what I want to ask. I guess I maybe just really want to ask you to talk about that sort of historical trajectory and what it means in broad terms. Though I recognize that that's exactly what we've been talking about this whole time. I guess I just wanted to phrase it in uh, a different way. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I can say a little about Kant. I, I'm a little uh, less confident in my ability to talk about Kant, but uh, I, you know, I'll just rely on, on Robert Pippin's account in a, in a little reading group uh, piece we read for Platypus, I think it's called The Short History of Non-Being, um, where he characterizes Kant as transforming traditional metaphysics by emphasizing that what we know is a function not of something in the object in itself, but in our, in our mode of knowing the object. Um, and so in that sense, Kant kind of disintegrates the idea of traditional metaphysics and sets up a kind of non-identity, I would suggest, between the subject of knowing and the object of knowing. That in traditional metaphysics, substance is known a priori because there's no, because what we know and what is in the world are identical with each other. For Kant, I think he also speaks to the emancipation of the bourgeois subject in a specific way in which they now recognize a kind of distinction or even a conceptual distinction to be made or that's so related between ourselves as the subjects of knowing and that the object of knowing is also ourselves in some sense, because it's con concerned with our conditions of knowing it. Uh, you know, he reserves space for the thing in itself, which, you know, I, I wouldn't want to get into here, but that uh, Kant recognizes a dialectic that Hegel kind of specifies and uh, says, look, this is what Kant was doing without even necessarily talking about it or being aware of it. Uh, and so in that sense, I think this is why Hegel thinks of himself as completing Kant or completing the critical philosophy, um, that he's the last account of philosophy you need because it's already pointing to philosophy as a mode of social relations uh, that, you know, and this goes back to Rousseau actually, uh, that what knowing might mean philosophically can be mediated through our participation in civil society. Um, is that sad? I mean, what was your second question? I can't. I guess the second question that is about Marx and the thesis on Feuerbach, right? So the end of philosophy, um, uh, as such. So I, I, I'm also I have in the back of my head maybe too many thoughts to to rattle uh, off. All well, that. actually, you know, this reminds me what I wanted to say to Tom. You know, I stayed away from the materialism idealism dialectic. I think if people follow the philosophy conversation in Platypus, one thing Teo and Jensen that do that I agree with is to say that Hegel was a materialist in some sense. Hegel recognized philosophy as being mediated in concrete material practices. I would say the converse of that is Marx, if we're, if we're using these dialectically, Marx is also an idealist. Marx recognizes self-consciousness as a moment in a process that plays a part. Uh, and so what is often remembered is Marx's critique of idealism. Marx also has a critique of materialism in the thesis on Feuerbach. And so I think the thing to signify there is not materialism or idealism, but dialectics, right? That, Marx has a critique of Feuerbachian, not what he would view as undialectical materialism. And I pointed to that thesis because what I'm saying is I don't think Marx abdicates the like raison d'etre philosophy to know the world, but recognizes that the point to knowing the world now presents itself as a question of transforming the object. I think Danny recently posted something great to Facebook, which is from this thesis as well, which is that man must prove the truth of his thinking, that to contemplate truth and see if it corresponds to a foreign reality is merely scholastic. And I think Hegel would view that as problematic as well. Uh, that rather, 
truth is a process in which we have to show that we know through being able to transform the object we're trying to know and thereby come to awareness or self-recognition of ourselves as subjects. You know, this is why Horkheimer will say it's not about in capitalism that we don't recognize the subject. It's that the subject doesn't exist. That in a kind of inability to recognize ourselves and transforming the object, both the object and the subject kind of disappear or disintegrate. That socialism would be the first step towards realizing the subject and thus overcoming it. But this, the, this is what Adorno means when he says uh, that philosophy continues because its moment of realization was missed. Yes, yes. Because to recognize the subject is not a kind of static claim, but is itself a process. And once that subject is recognized, uh, the, un the no a kind of knowledge is achieved, which is then realized in the world. That like knowing and changing the world from out from marks are intimately bound up. Well, thank you, Omar. Yeah. John, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry, the wrong mic was um, set. Okay. Uh, so I have a couple things. One of them kind of relate. One of my questions kind of relates to uh, your earlier discussion of the master-slave dialectic, particularly as that's kind of taken up by Adorno in his studies on Hegel. Uh -huh. um, so you do mention that, uh, I guess part of the point of this dialectic is that the sort of the slave, the sort of unfree subjectless subject um, recognizes himself in the objects he creates. And I wanted to point out that I think in Hegel three studies, Adorno kind of uh, locates actually a moment of reconciliation in that dialectic. And I'm just wondering if that could possibly, if you could maybe specify how that can point way to where, or can kind of point towards where Hegel and Marx themselves point ways. And I guess my other, uh, my other couple comments or questions was um, Aaron's question actually reminded me of uh, particularly romanticism as a kind of necessary form of appearance of bourgeois society and capital as like, because we live in capitalism, we necessarily want to return to pre-bourgeois forms, which I think Marx actually states uh, fairly explicitly in the, in the Grundrisse. Uh -huh. um, and I was wondering if you could possibly, you know, if, how, how that relates to maybe this category of necessary misrecognition that you were elaborating is kind of a distinction between Marx and Hegel. Totally. Okay, so the first question, I mean, so this is everyone in Platypus hears this all the time, particularly from Chris, which is that yes, Adorno has a critique of Hegel as appearing uh, an espouser of identity thinking that in his master-slave dialectic, because there's a kind of assumed recognition through changing the object that you come to awareness of the self, this appears to Adorno in retrospect, in history, in what Hegel has become as ideological and a kind of identity thinking, because it assumes precisely what becomes absent in capitalism, which is the self-recognition through labor. And I think that's Adorno's point there, that perhaps Hegel was accurate in describing the radical kind of uh, repercussions of a slave working on something and through that recognition of transformation, understanding himself as something different than a slave. For Adorno, the problem is that becomes an upholder of a society in which that same dynamic that led to freedom is dominating us. In other words, what I talked about with Marx, that it's exactly at the site of labor, the site of the dialectic of freedom for Hegel, that the dialectic breaks down in capitalism. Because the point is we work probably more and harder than ancient peoples have ever worked, and yet the recognition of ourselves in the object is precisely what's being denied to us or actually reproduced actively by our working. The more we work, the more we change the world, the more the world appears foreign to us. And I think that's once again to recognize Dorna's criticism as an expression of a changed historical moment, not simply a kind of one set of an epistemological concerns against another set of traditional epistemological concerns that he's simply just negating. Rather, he recognizes both moments as a kind of aspect of the contradiction of capitalism. You know, people go to work and they do feel fulfilled and they do feel like they make an impact on society. Hegel is still with us. And at the same time, going to work only produces a dynamic in which society is running away from us and appearing to dominate us. Um, and then what was your second question? I'm sorry, Justin. Oh, um, it was actually, it was building on Aaron's. It was building on Aaron's question regarding uh, sort of, I guess, 
what she kind of mentioned is the return. Po well, first she mentioned postmodernism as a sort of premature post-capitalism, but also uh, this like sort of yearning for a return to um, modes of labor that are pre-capitalist. And I was sure. just asking you to talk about romanticism as a necessary misrecognition of capitalism. Yeah, I think there's necessarily a romantic recoil against capitalism. Once again, that it's not a thought mistake. It's not people being too sentimental or not adequately recognizing the problem or something. They might lack a certain self-awareness, but they express the reality of the crisis, which is that, why did this happen in the first place? I mean, this goes back to Rousseau, who says that, look, if freedom is not achieved, then it would be regrettable that we move from an imaginary state of nature to our social relations. Um, and in one way, this necessity appears for Marx, and I think for the best Marxists in capitalism, is that philosophy and art are precisely inherently necessarily romantic in capitalism. That philosophy as expressing a kind of conception of truth as achievable uh, kind of papers over the fact that the knowledge problem is a problem in this society in which to know the world, as Lukács says, we would only know this society when we've overcome it. And so to claim, to make claims to truth, philosophical claims to truth is romantic in this society because it leaves the problem at the level of, of contemplative thinking. And I would say the same with art, that the best art for Hegel and for this tradition recognizes itself as expressing a kind of reconciliation between necessity and freedom or subject and object or objective circumstances and subjective inclinations. And precisely by expressing this kind of unity, it's romantic and then it's papering over a real contradiction. The fact that subject and object aren't identical in this society, that they're torn apart. Um, but of course, we still need art and philosophy precisely because their moment of realization was missed. And so yes, the romantic, I think, conception of this society as a potential site of the mediation or reconciliation between subjective and objective circumstances is romantic. And yet that romanticism expresses a real kind of problem, if recognized correctly. Um, Thank you. That's perfect. That reminds me of uh, Lukács, where he says that uh, Hegel and Marx part ways at, at reality, that it's reality itself that sort of is regressing, that that, that, right. that makes Hegel apologetic. Thank you. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Grant, and I think, is your hand still up or do you have another question? Right, I left it up. I don't have okay. any other questions. Aaron, is your hand still left up or is that just? Oh, I do have a new question. Okay. Yeah. It'll take us somewhere else and it's a bit open-ended. So I hope that that will be- Yeah, other people feel free to jump in as, yeah. You know, a lot of your uh, remarks were just about like kind of what philosophy is uh -huh. and getting into like the, what Hegel's kind of role is in that. Uh -huh. So I was wondering if, you know, what you think the relationship is between philosophy and politics. In other uh -huh. words, philosophy and the state kind of specifically. Um, yeah, I think it can remain open like that. I mean, you know, because in some sense, thinking about like the state, you know, and thinking about philosophy come from the same place. Like ancient philosophy is also writing about, you know, what sort of state there should be, right? That's Plato's uh, um, Republic. Um, so I was just wondering about that. And um, also, you know, maybe if you have any thoughts about Hegel's philosophy of right, because recently in um, a coffee break in Australia, uh, this scholar named Daniel Lopez, I think, was invited to speak. And his kind of view yeah. on Hegel was that philosophy of right is like a political program. It just needs to be updated by Marxists to uh, like include labor, basically, or like social democracy. Um, uh, so I think it's interesting how people kind of, the but, Hegel has to do also with an interest in like the state and a certain type of politics. Uh, Richard, were you gonna say something? May I add just a brief question? I wanted to add a question directly onto Aaron's. So uh, do you think that philosophy would exist under socialism? Or do you think that art would exist under socialism? Yeah. Um, so I mean, about philosophy of right, I, once again, that's like one text that I don't feel adequate to making meta claims about. But, uh, you know, Adorno points out that it's interesting, which is that the phenomenology in, in like modern capitalism is like maybe Hegel's most returned to book. And Adorno thinks it's a, an expression of a symptom that's what, what's returned to as a retrospective account of bourgeois freedom. 
In fact, a moment that we can't really return to, the emergence of bourgeois consciousness. Whereas you could say that the philosophy of right is a more concrete intervention into a quote unquote political uh, kind of task. And then that's kind of overlooked for the sake of an account of the emergence of bourgeois subjectivity. And Adorno thinks that's symptomatic of something. Um, you know, philosophy and politics, I think, you know, one thing one might succumb to is to say that as a result of this, the point is that you need politics and not philosophy. What I think Marx thinks is that you need a critical recognition of both as expressing a contradiction. Uh, that it's not about a kind of action that the problem can only be solved at the level of action and not thinking, rather both action and thinking are expressing a self-contradiction between subjective and objective, uh, between means and ends. Um, you know, you could go down the list. And so I think- Politics isn't action. Politics is action mediated by a state. Uh -huh. uh, so I guess another way I would put it is that, you know, you could also say that Adorno's time that politics and the state lives on because its moment of realization was missed, right? There's a conception in Marxism that socialism would actually finally allow politics for the first time, allow people to finally participate in the struggle for power over, over society. And yet at the same time, dialectically, that kind of struggle for power would also be rendered unnecessary. But, but I'll admit Omer, isn't the, the need for the state in class society, doesn't it serve an objective purpose? Whereas doesn't philosophy, the need for philosophy serve an essentially subjective purpose? Aren't they quite different in relationship to society? That might be true. That might be true. Um, yeah, I don't know though, because I mean, do we need art? I don't know. I don't think, I think once again, that art would claim that it serves an objective purpose and philosophy might be valid in claiming that it's sub it serves an objective purpose too. And I don't think Adorno, someone like Adorno wouldn't look at like philosophical attempts after Marx as merely subjective failings. Rather Heidegger expresses an objective necessity. He might, he might misunderstand or not be self-conscious of like what he's expressing, but it's an objective phenomenon. It's not merely like a faulty kind of irrational person. There's a reason Heidegger came into being and became popular for Adorno, a, a very objective one. And that as a symptom, it's as validly objective as the state. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. But I mean, the overcoming of the state is a political process, uh -huh. right? A through a revolution. Like what the overcoming of philosophy means would seem to be something else, would seem to be a an inner intellectual process. Maybe that people will not need philosophy anymore if they live in a free society, or they might not need art anymore, or philosophy and art would become something completely different. No, Whereas just, the state are special bodies of our men. The state has a kind of objective character well, relating you know, I to guess class I'm society. I'm relating them maybe more than I intended to, which is that, you know, to what extent is the need for a state also a kind of intellectual problem that like, you know, anarchists call for the abolition of the state. There's people who, who want a stateless society, but there's also people who say, look, it wouldn't work because we need something to organize our social relations. Similarly, when you talk about the abolition of philosophy, you'll get the argument, but in, in arguments I'm sure you're familiar with that you need an overarching logic or an account of intelligibility as such to be able to make sense of the world. And so I think both are kind of I wouldn't let's say one is more objectively real than the other uh, and that and that to uh, what overcoming philosophy would look like it might be as abstract and kind of enigmatic as saying we would be able to overcome the state in the future no one knows what that would look like either and there's probably real concern to say what if that's just lawlessness and caprice and criminality institutionalized um, so but 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 would you see that as freedom I mean most of us would see overcoming the state and living in a society that was generally free as progress. So, but then you're saying, would that be also freedom to not need philosophy anymore for human beings? Yeah, I mean, maybe it doesn't appear that way, but to me, it appears that way. It would be great to not have to like bang my head against like philosophy over and over again, right? That like, if I, <laughs> I would feel good about being freed from the kind of, uh, necessity that's problematic of philosophy. 
Um, that to me, that sounds like freedom too. But I mean, I mean, obviously, to some people, it sounds like a kind of disruption or or uh, a kind of denial of the fact that we need a mutual, we need an account of intelligibility or something. But to me, that sounds kind of great. And maybe I'm an anarchist of the mind or something. I don't know. Uh, Do you feel the same way about art? Yes. Yes. I, I think, uh, you know, that art is for art. You know, I'm an artist. And Adorno says, like, perhaps all art comes from a neurotic place. It comes from a place of wanting to compensate for something that's not there in life and reality. And, and so I don't see overcoming art as a kind of denial of my aesthetic concerns or interests but as their sublation into life, into reality. That, you know, the 60s claim to, to suture together art and life might be well-intended, but it might be premature. And really it expresses the fact that we do see a real antagonism between art and life. Um, Did you see the comment in the chat? No, let me see. Omer? I'm looking at it right now. From Grant? Wouldn't the overcoming of philosophy, art, and politics be a transvaluation of value, meaning that all three infeudism are one? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I think so. I mean, so to go back to Aaron's question about the relationship between philosophy and politics, I, I don't know if this is the answer she was looking for, or if she wants to specify, but I, I would say that there is a relationship in that the Marxist understanding is that politics itself would also be overcome in, in a future communist society that the need for the struggle of power, uh, the force, right? When Engels says, when bourgeois right meets bourgeois right, force must decide, or that revolution is the most authoritarian thing there is. There is a problem to that. There is a kind of, oh shit, that sucks. We need force and authoritarianism to, to free ourselves. And yet the imagination might be that we won't always need that. And I think that relates to art and philosophy and what Grant is saying, that there was a kind of, unity prior to bourgeois society of the three. And once again, that their non-identity in bourgeois society sounds kind of terrible and crisis ridden and it is, but it's actually an expression of freedom. The fact that we can reflect on them separately rather than having them confront us as one cohesive world for Hegel and Marx expressed the fact that they might be changed and overcome. Uh, so yeah, Grant, I agree. Uh, I, we can return to these, but I think Mike had his hand up. Yeah, um, I'm, thanks, Omer. Uh, this is actually going to follow on from what's just been said. It's, it's, it's less of a question and more just something that um, I'd appreciate it if you could speak to or um, tell me where, where my understanding may be faltering somewhat, something like that. Um, in this discussion of, of art, the, the abolition or overcoming of art, the abolition or overcoming of, of philosophy, um, I'm interested in this distinction between those two disciplines, categories, and that of the state. Um, because one thing that, that it, it, in my relatively sort of uh, formative understanding of, of the history of Marxism and Marxist thought, um, one thing that sort of stood out to me uh, is the spatial aspect, and what I mean by that is um, this: this is this is going to be extremely linear and very very vulgar, and 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 I apologise in advance for that. But I, I have this image in my head of, even though there are caveats, of sort of over time this 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 gradual development building upwards, if you like, from uh, the first form of society and that of the family, and building up to say uh, tribal societies and and um, and, and, and then kingdoms, etc. Uh, obviously, it's not as linear as that. It's not as um, it's not as clear cut as that. There are uh, contingencies, but essentially, it's, it's this spatial aspect. That's not me. <laughs> Is that Luke? I think Luke's got his microphone on. Um, yeah. Uh, so it's yeah. What was I? It's it's very it's very sort of it's a bit vulgar, but. Um, yeah, I, I get I, this spatial aspect leaps out at me, and so I, I get this feeling that um, in the overcoming of, of of the state as it stands, as as Richard said, the the special bodies of armed men, um, which is you know a desirable overcoming, uh, but at the same time, the state in bourgeois society, as far as I understand it, was there 
as a sort of guarantor of freedom, right? It's, it's, this, it's this sort of aid to freedom. It's there as a preserver of these bourgeois freedoms. Um, the overcoming of that says to me less about we're getting rid of this, this, this is oppressive thing above us. And it's more that we no longer have need for that, but more so it's because humanity has literally become global, become international and can constitute itself as an international civil society of, of enlightened individuals, whatever that might look like. Uh, and it just, to me, I don't, I don't see much of a difference between that and the overcoming of, say, something like philosophy and art, which I, uh, in my, as I say, in my limited understanding, relates to something like um, Adorno's description of, say, uh, what Luther did, where Luther puts the priest in the hearts of men, right? But then the point is to overcome religion. Uh, so we're participants in a civil society right now, but the representative of that civil society is the political community uh, in the form of the bourgeois state, I think. Um, and also in Rousseau, you've got the state acting as a subject on the national stage. And to my mind, it's, it's a case of it's as well as this overcoming, it's a reduction of everything to its purest human essence, but also the unfettering of those things for the human. And I, so I just think, yeah, as I was listening to all of that, then I was just thinking that there's, there was less of a difference between them than I thought was being made out. But I, I could be wrong on that. So I was just wondering if I haven't just talked total nonsense, if you could speak to something about that, Omer, please. No, I think those are all good points that I would agree with. I mean, it made me think, right, that one thing I would specify is that the state was also, in, I mean, and I'm not, I don't, I'm not completely confident in my ability to speak on the philosophy of right. But that I would think that for Hegel, the state is also a site of a mediation between antinomies, right? A mediation between self and society, between individual and collective. So similar to philosophy and art being mediations of art, for example, being a mediation of the antinomy between what is free and what is necessary or what is natural, nature and freedom. That in art, we take a given material, a natural material, and transform it and fuse it with our own kind of subjectivity and in this way mediate between what seem like two opposed things that the state for Hegel performs a similar function and that it mediates between a productive non-identity between ourselves as individuals and ourselves as responsible to a social whole. Uh, and capitalism, the ability of these things to mediate those antinomies seems to be more and more suspect. And yet, you know, let's people still want a state. I mean, in this society, people still recognize perhaps problematically the state as a guarantor of a kind of social reason that individuals, that benefit individuals, but that individuals are incapable of realizing on their own. Until socialism, the state is necessary uh, to attempt to mediate those antinomies. And the reason it rises above society is for that purpose. Once again, it's obvious that it fails at doing this. Um, but if we recognize the state as a mediation of a dialectical contradiction for Hegel, uh, overcoming the state would amount to an overcoming of that contradiction or transformation of that contradiction as we understand it. Does that speak to what you're saying? Or? Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much, Amar. Yeah. Jenny, do you have another question? Uh, yeah, I guess I wanted to come back to what um, came up in your discussion um, in response to the ideals and materialism stuff. Uh -huh. um, because I just kind of guess I wanted to bring up as well, like what, why is Marx interested, let's say in the dialectic, right? In, in that case, because, um, you know, A, it's kind of colloquial in uh, the Marxist tradition to kind of yell at each other to be more dialectical, right? It's at the beginning of the Rosa Luxemburg movie where they have a kind of almost flirtatious back and forth where it's like, oh, you got to be dialectical in the sense. On the other hand, you also have suggested in your teaching that Marx also thinks there's something beyond at least the dialectic as it's known hitherto in that sense. And so it raises this sort of interesting question of like, you know, Marx was planning on writing even like a primer on Hegel's logic, uh -huh. like to give to workers or to at least give to, you know, people organizing workers in that sense. Um, and so I guess I was kind of thinking like, at what level are we sort of talking about the need for dialectics? In other words, 
Marx's very early kind of um, encounters with you know the controversies in Hegelianism with young Hegelianism is this question of like uh, of materialist dialectics like Feuerbach for example, and Feuerbach says Hegel transcends himself but transcends himself in thought, and Marx is kind of like yes and no. He's not you know one of these vulgar Marxists who's like oh it's in mental activity and you got to get your hands dirty and change the world right. This is how people interpret the theses on Feuerbach, it's not about being in an ivory tower, it's about activism, it's about actually changing the world, changing the conditions in that sense. But why it could appear to be the case that it looks like Hegel's doing something at the level of thought without actually, you know, and I'm not accusing Hegel of this, but why, it could, why we could receive him as such, that it could be like, oh, this is in terms of, um, thinking and that in terms of the actual practical circumstances in that case. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, this is why you'll find lines in Marx, like in the Holy Family, the distinction between thinking and being, whereas that was in a lot of ways Hegel was putting that as a speculative identity. Right. That was kind of like, you know, this is sort of a, a famous moment in, in Hegel's logic. And you know, something that that comes up in Marx's time, of course, is the reserve army of labor, meaning people who are literally outside of society. They don't count. It's almost like they don't be, they don't, right? They're non-being in that sense. And so returning to this question of the dialectic, I guess the way that I take it, and I could be wrong, and I'm interested in your thoughts, is that it's not really at the level of individuals, perhaps if they're um, representing Right, they're party members that are expressing the, the will of the proletariat. You can accuse each other of being dialectical, but rather the need for the proletariat as a class, right, in order to form itself has to be dialectical, right? It has to, but that's actually something that's maybe blocked for us at an individual level. Yeah. And so hence you get the view of Hegelian dialectics becoming ideological in that it appears to be like transcending in thought, but then therefore actually really falling below. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the real desiderata of dialectics, which is would be the self-transformation on the part of, of the, the subject and object. And instead, it's just kind of like a speculation, but then it actually ends up just being ideological and therefore being roasted pigeons flying from your mouth. I didn't clarify anything if I was unclear, but. No, I think I, think I get the grasp of the question. And the point would be that this society produces undialectical thinking and action. Like that we shouldn't naturalize the split we assume between thinking and the world, theory and praxis, subject and object, that precisely, right? That the kind of left-right Hegelian split is once again, I think you would agree, not a matter of bad thinking, but an expression of an objective crisis. The split between like, you know, something like a Heideggerian ontology and a post or, or a kind of ontology an eternal truth about everything and a kind of postmodern relativism. The fact that those two coexist in one society is an expression of the crisis. So I think that thought and reality began to appear antonymical in a way in which for Hegel, they were a kind of non-identity that was productive and mediated. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to read the chat. Well, yeah, can I, I'll read this quote out, out loud. This is from Rosa Luxemburg. <laughs> I think this is the only time I really know her even quoting Hegel in this sense. But she says, um, the individual person cannot take a step further when he faces a contradiction in his private life. He will even accept in matters of everyday life that contradiction is something impossible. So that an accused person who gets tangled up in contradictions when he appears in court is thereby already found guilty of untruth. And in certain circumstances, contradictions can lead him into prison or even to the gallows. But human society as a whole develops continuously in contradictions. And rather than succumbing to these, it only starts to move when it meets contradictions. Contradiction in the life of society, in other words, is always resolved by development in new advances of culture. The great philosopher Hegel said, and this is out of the logic of essence, Contradiction is the very moving principle of the world. And this movement in the thick of contradictions is precisely the actual mode of development of human society. 
In the particular case we are concerned with here, i.e. the transition from communist society to private property with the division of labor and exchange, she's talking about primitive communist society, the contradiction that we found is also resolved in a particular development along historical process. But this process was essentially just as we originally depicted. This is just the passage from her introduction to political economy. But I guess my, my, my point there, and I think this is what you were getting at, is that in a sense, people in thought become dialectical as a function of actual, you know, the world actually becomes reified. People actually yeah. become, um, to quote, Adorno and Horkheimer or dialectic of enlightenment stunted, they're blocked, were prevented from truly being dialectical in a way that when Hegel was writing with, you know, his, his classic works, at least at that moment, didn't seem like a block. It actually, as you were just saying, you know, estrangement then was something that one could work through because there was an opportunity to truly integrate into society. And so now it seems like what Marx, you know, when he says I need to what is it, um, extract the rational kernel from the Hegelian dialectic, that he's really thinking about the proletariat and not just in terms of supplanting with, you know, political economy or something like that um, at, at the level. And that's reflecting the changed conditions from Hegel to Marx's time. But maybe I've interpreted it wrong and I'm just curious. Yeah, I think that's right. That like as a function of the dialectic become becoming self contradictory, the dialectic itself disintegrates because dialectics is a kind of mediation of contradiction. And when things, when the mediation between something like subjectivity and objectivity breaks down, both objectivity and subjectivity wither away. Um, you know, this is why Adorno in a writing about Benjamin will say that the point is to think dialectically and undialectically at the same time, uh, that there's something undialectical about the appearance of society and self-contradiction, ironically. Um, and right, so symptoms like a kind of subjectivism or an objectivism, an economism or a kind of uh, free willing, like if we can think it, we can do it. Uh, both are expressions of a kind of breakdown in the dialectic, that they become flat antinomies that can't be related or mediated anymore in a productive way. Um, yeah, totally. I, I agree with that. And so like, right, that for Feuerbach to point to a kind of materialism of, of matter or sensuousness, Marx will say what you don't grasp is that sensuous matter is also human activity. But why does it appear that way to Feuerbach in the moment he's writing? as a function, I would argue, of, of Hegel's dialectic breaking down, the dialectic between thought and matter, spirit and matter breaking down, in which you get more and more desperate attempts to kind of put together what's been torn apart. I wanted to get to, who is this, Johannes? Um, did I mute him? Is he on still? Let me just read his chat question and then we can get to Richard and Mike. Um, okay, it might be a basic question, but I have my problems with that. So when Hegel says the reality is reasonable and reason is real, from my understanding, does that mean that society is reasonable or has become reasonable with the expansion of bourgeois society? So that the relationship between society to itself and its reproduction and its relationship to nature is now understandable. Thus, history becomes through its universal character, a reasonable history, therefore a history of the progress of freedom. So you said that reality for Hegel is reasonable and also not reasonable. I wonder how this second side of the coin, the irrationality of reality is to understand. I'm confused because I always treated this as the news of capitalism, which brought the rational left side in a, dialectical, in a dialectical addition to the reasonability of reality. Or another side that this is Marx realizing a different world than Hegel did because of a qualitative flip of bourgeois society into, into crisis under capitalism. I think I try to push you to specify the relationship between bourgeois society and capitalism, as well as the difference between Hegel and Marx. I, I guess what I was arguing, and maybe I am projecting Marx into Hegel, but maybe that's a conversation to be had, is that if we understand rationality itself as a movement and not a kind of static state, uh, that that movement proceeds through contradiction. And so to simply 
assert that reality is rational because we can understand it, doesn't recognize that both our understanding and rationality and reality are changing, are moving in a process of self-negation. And so I think, I think Lukács puts it this way, maybe someone correct me, that there's a truth to the false moment. There's a rationality to the irrational moment for Hegel because this is how change is expressing itself. That what exists to the extent to which it points to transformation that's reasonable uh, must also deny its own reasonability. Otherwise, how would change happen? If there's a simple identity of reality and rationality, how does change happen? That the irrational plays a part in the dialectic. The false plays a part in the unfolding of truth. Um, and so maybe that sounds like Marx, right? But I would say that's actually just Hegel. And that for Marx, uh, yeah, how would I, let me think about that. That rather than the false playing a part in the unfolding of the true, for Marx, now the unfolding of the true appears to us as false and dominating, um, an inverted kind of dialectic, uh, right? To crib off of dialectic of enlightenment, that in light, if enlightenment is the process of kind of self-knowledge through a transformative contradiction, that same process of a transformative self-contradiction has itself become self-undermining. That that process of contradiction leading to freedom is now precisely what dominates us in its unfolding. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's clarifying, but I would say to specify that I do think false and irrationality Okay, I got a thumbs up. But yeah, the, the falseness and irrationality of a moment is a part of the unfolding of reason for Hegel. Um, okay, Richard, did you wanna? Yeah, um, there's a term you've used constantly and I just would like you to sort of specify it and talk more about it, which is the term contradiction. And I guess negation goes along with that. So, I mean, within say someone coming from a more analytic tradition, Contradiction is something that only applies to propositions. The contradictory proposition would just be false. Whereas self-contradiction in Hegel seems to refer to a much broader category um, and applies to things and society and so forth. So I think I'd like it if you talked a bit about this category of contradiction in Hegel um, and how you see its role and also the difference between that conception of contradiction and say, uh, the kind one would encounter in analytic philosophy or what's called formal logic or something right. like that. Right, now Jarrett, who's a member of Platypus Cincinnati has an analytic philosophy background. He, he studied philosophy at, at a university and that's what is kind of popular. And so we get into this kind of discussion all the time. And that's why, and so he will say that what I'm saying is a contradiction, it's just not a contradiction. It's not a logical contradiction. And so maybe I like the term non-identity better, which I think is related. Uh, and once again, I think with analytic philosophy, the problem is that you're dealing with a kind of assumption of an unchanging or static truth, right? That a, a logical proposition asserts what's true. And if that logic contradicts itself, neither thing can be true at the same time. And, but if we think of truth as a temporal process rather than a static thing, then we can understand perhaps how something that was true becomes false in a process that leads to another truth or a higher truth. Uh, that is, what is the truth? I mean, to go back to that kind of silly metaphor, what is the truth of the seed? If the truth of the seed is simply in being a seed, well, that's actually not true because it becomes something else. And so, go ahead. No, if you go back to, I mean, Hegel addresses this. If you go back to the, you know, the fundamental opposition between say, Parmenides and Heraclitus, right? It's not, that, Her that Hegel is totally on the side of Heraclitus. I mean, he has great respect for Parmenides, right? There's the sense of potentially that beyond, you know, this idea of time and change being illusions, right? And, and Hegel has respect for that as embodying some kind of truth, right? And I'm just sort of, there is a way of talking about time, right? The distinction between, you know, the eternal or the sempiternal, right? the idea of truth that exists timelessly, right? And it does seem to me that Hegel, at least, leaving aside Marx, does have some conception also of a traditional timeless truth, or used to think not. 
I mean, I was thinking about this, uh, and I, I figured it would come up. And I don't know, because I think what's assumed in something like my position is to say that truth changes. Whereas what I'm saying is that truth is eternal because it is a process of change. I think someone, Justin, recently posted a Dorno quote that it's that truth isn't in history, or what is it? Truth isn't in history, but history is in truth. That the process of transformation through contradiction is the unfolding of truth. So that doesn't mean that what once was true statically becomes untrue statically. It's not a kind of relativism. Rather, it's saying why philosophy is concerned with what is eternally present is because the present sublates all of the past into it and transforms it along with the kind of contingency of the mere moment. That philosophy is eternal precisely because it's concerned with the transformation of eternity and time. I well, very, yeah, go ahead. Well, let me ask you this thing. So one of the traditional oppositions of traditionally philosophy and history would have been counter, right? You, you cut out, Richard. Right, Hegel finds a fundamental. I said, so in traditional, like say Greek thinking, right? Uh -huh. Philosophy and history would have seemed counterposed disciplines, right? That one deals with change or events and the other deals with, with you know, contingent events and the other deals with, with something of, a, of an eternal transcendent. And, and in Hegel, of course, there's this profound reversal of this and this idea that history itself is of profound significance and also that the history of philosophy itself is of profound significance, right? I'm not sure if that is necessarily the same problem is dialectics, but that, that awareness is actually more striking to me than the notion of progress through contradiction. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think that is striking. I, I mean, I would just say that I think for Hegel, history moves dialectically, but I think we could leave that out and still say that, yes, it is striking that what was viewed as merely contingent uh, because it, it changes, is like substantial for Hegel. You know, and I think like we would have to some, and I don't know if I have a great answer to this, but somehow, somehow ground the antinomy between eternity, eternal truth, and merely historical relativistic truth as symptoms of something that encompass both. Um, because I feel like that's what this philosophy kind of debate ends up kind of butting heads against is that is truth eternal or is truth historically contingent? Well, I think Hegel is saying like, both, but also neither. The point isn't that the truth is historically contingent, but that history itself, the movement of history is truth. By the philosophy debate, you're talking about the stuff between Chris and Jensen and Teo? Sure, I mean, I guess, I, yeah, I haven't really said anything about it uh, on my own, but this was in the back of my head, obviously, when I was writing this teaching. And you feel closer to Chris's side, I'm gathering. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I wanted to, but I think sometimes some of it comes to like how one poses the problem in which I think, yeah, I think you, you could entertain that Hegel is interested in truth, a, a truth that's no less real or substantial or uh, kind of true, validly, eternally true, uh, without succumbing to the fact that this doesn't mean that truth is also a process of transformation. And I think those two kind of antinomies have to be like somehow dealt with and held together. Tom, did you want to say something? Yeah, um, I and mean, I think that like, you know, I come from a much more analytic place um, and it seems to me that that one of the things that's that confuses is that we're actually um people can be talking about different things when they mean by by truth sure. um and and um that um that perhaps the discussion shouldn't be so much you know what is the nature of truth as is what way of understand of invoking um that word do we find philosophically or politically useful? Because um, you know, because in terms of um, um, you know, new, 
Newtonian mechanics is all about understanding change and calculus is all about understanding change and um, and the way that that people uh, that that analytic people would deal with um, with with your example of the seed is to say well at time t1 um, you had a seed at time t2 um, you you um, the, the seed became became a bud or whatever and basically the truth that at t1 um it was a seed is it will always be true regardless of what number t you're at um and that would seem to miss the point of um of of that that that, that when when you're saying the truth of the seed is actually not the seed that's a that's a very completely different you're using the two sides are using language in a completely different way um and so the question shouldn't be so much as what is the right um conception of truth is as what sort of why would you use invoke one set of one understanding of truth rather than another i mean i guess i would suggest that there's a relationship between the two for hegel but also that, you know, you're right. I mean, Richard's kind of brought this up too, that maybe I'm specifying change too much as the criteria of dialectics, where I think where I really part ways with analytic philosophy, at least Marxism or Hegelianism might, is that it's not a kind of, a, it's not a kind of um, contemplation of a truth outside of us, but that this process of attaining to truth is something we're participating in. That we're constituting inner social practices. Um, so it's not about kind of like going out and measuring the temperature or analyzing an external object's spatial uh, kind of presence, uh, but recognizing that the act of participating in the world is producing the object that we're trying to know. And I, I, I like that Danny says, truth tasks us. Um, which is why I would want to, uh, you know, that we're not satisfied with saying what's true for us, right? Like, well, that doesn't satisfy us. I don't think we want to, We want. We want the objective and the subjective. Uh, yeah, I don't know if other people have thoughts on that. I, I know it's a loaded word to use, and I, I, I kind of foresaw, but I think it's important to at least be honest that Hegel isn't a pragmatist necessarily. It's not a lower case, case truth. It's not a truth of whatever works for us. It's truth. It's capital T truth. It's the absolute. Uh, he doesn't kind of uh, fall away from that ambition of what does it mean for subject to be substance, to be actual substance. So that would be my only response to that. Um, how, do, how do you see that category of substance, which is also, again, a far older category in philosophy? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, Since I, you I, used it a lot, I'm just curious. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know the history of the usage of that word in other philosophy. Um, I would say, like, the use of, you know, to look at the proposition subject as substance. It's to say that they're both identical, but not identical. They're not the same thing, yet, yet they're related, obviously. Uh, and so it expresses a kind of distinction in dialectical thinking and dialectical reality. Another example would be essence and appearance, right? That Hegel says the essence must appear, and yet the categories are slightly different to indicate a kind of non-identity between how something appears and what its essence is. And so I think that's where the language of substance comes in too. That substance, the truth of the objective, potentially foreign material sensuous world is the subject's own re reflection, but that's a mediated process of something that's also not identical. The subject is also not identical to substance and thus achieves a kind of constitutive identity in, in history. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, like, when you said that, how you would perceive, like, earlier, not Greek philosophy, but earlier bourgeois philosophy, huh. you know, sort of, like, say, between, like, people like Descartes and, uh, like, do they anticipate for you 
like Hegel, or do they seem still stuck in a, essentially a traditional metaphysics, even if something different from like a classical metaphysics? Yeah, I mean, this is where I'm weak. I mean, I, I would say obviously there's a process that doesn't just happen with Hegel. I mean, I think Kant in ways I kind of talked about inaugurates and makes Hegel possible. Um, you know, if we think, I don't know if this is fair to say, but if we think of Descartes as indicating the fact that subjective reflection, even if it's not true, is something we're certain of doing, right? That it's not that I think and therefore I am true, but what I can be certain of is the fact that I'm thinking, you know, that moment of the recognition of like the validity and significance and perhaps necessity of subjective reflection, I think is something that German idealism takes off with. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Omer. I have yeah, to go now. I think we should wrap up anyway. Um, if there's further questions, you know, feel free to email or on the list or something. But uh, yeah, thanks everyone, and uh, hopefully I'll, I'll send out a recording to to the list. And this article, for those of you who aren't in the organization, might appear in the Platypus Review soon. Great, thanks everyone. Thanks, Omer. That was really good. Great, thanks.